for uh, coming to my talk. My name is Brent White. I want to talk about hacking web apps, more, uh, more along the lines of sort of an introduction. And the reason I like to present this talk is to sort of help close the gap between developers who are not quite sure how to secure their apps or their code, or anybody who's interested in getting into InfoSec. So I'm going to basically give a high level overview of, as a security consultant, what I do from client kickoff call all the way to a report delivery for an assessment for an application, web application. So before you can start hacking a web, a web app and you know, going to town on a client's website, there's a few things that you have to do first. Uh, we usually will have a kickoff call and this is where we'll discuss the things such as uh, in the rules of engagement document where this this clarifies the scope. So what is the URL that we're actually looking at? Uh, what IPs uh, is, is the, malicious, the malicious traffic gonna come from? So they know, you know, if they have a security operations center or something, they're not alerting everyone because they are expecting us to be sending malicious traffic at a certain time. And then when do we start the assessment and when do we stop? Also, if we happen to knock over a service or there's an issue on either end, we have points of contact so we know who we can call, wake up at three in the morning and uh, hear their happy voice that we broke something. Keep in mind that during this assessment, document as much as you can because a report is expected at the end of the assessment. So there have been times uh, as a new consultant where there were vulnerabilities that I found but I was excited to keep going and so I forgot to document this and when it came time for reporting I had to ask the client for more access to the system because I forgot to document something so just keep that in mind and just document everything as you go how do I document stuff my choice is keep note and this is available in Kali Linux, it also has install for Mac OS or Windows. And it's just a, it's an open source tool that allows you to put in code snippets or screenshots or links or basically anything. And the cool thing about it is that if the client or another consultant wants to see sort of your raw notes before you break it down and put it in the report, you can just export all of it as basic HTML files so they can see everything without having to install keep note as well if they don't have it. So that's pretty handy. Uh, so you can see, this is just kind of a quick example of how I like to break things down. So if there are, if I'm working on a few different applications uh, on, on the same assessment, then you can see like I have it broken down by IP right here or the host name and then I'll put whatever I find, or if it's just a handful or one application, then I'll do uh, you know, just a single layout of what I find. And you'll find too that the more that you do this, you're gonna change the, ways that you, the way that you document things. This is probably the third or fourth time that I've changed how I do this, and I found that this is what works best for me, and it's what helps me to move along faster during reporting and uh, just referencing vulnerabilities. So just play around with it. The color coding, the green, I use that just to say, okay, this is just some quick go-to information, like what's the scope? If I forget a username or password, I can look at that and say, I can ignore everything that's green. Uh, the dark red, those are my criticals, and then the red would be serious or high or however your, your company rates those things, and so on. And for me, that's just a quick visual of you know, how the application is looking so far. What do you document? So a lot of times, well, for every web app test, you're gonna have your HTTP request and response. You wanna document those. That way the client can see what it is that you sent and what the actual response was. This way, when they go through and they are trying to remediate these things, they can, re they can reproduce the same results that you got. You also want to make sure to note any unscheduled downtime. So if you're, trying, you're accessing the application and all of a sudden it's gone and you can't access it anymore, make sure you write down when that happened. 
That way, if something did go down, if it was a, an accidental denial of service or something, then you can say, okay, this happened at 1142, and this will help their guys to be able to go back and look at logs and try and track it down. So it just makes it a lot easier for the client as well. And if they give you test accounts, and uh, when you do change the passwords, make sure you let them know what the new passwords are. Some people get upset if you change it and don't let them know. And then again, let's say if you're working on a bank website or e-commerce or something, and they don't give you a test credit card and you have to use uh, you know, something from the company or something, make sure that you log that so they will you know, give you your money back at the end. And then an important pro tip, if you have a really cool hack, I've seen guys get in trouble with this before. If you have a really cool hack and it's exciting, especially if it's one of your first ones, do not share a screenshot of that online. If you do, make sure you sanitize it so that you can't tell necessarily where it came from. So uh, just keep that in mind. And then some more on evidence gathering. When you're putting your screenshots in your report or something that you're going to send to the, to the client, make sure that it's something they can actually read. Just keep in mind, if you have a, if you have a really big resolution on your screen and you do the entire screenshot, but then the report is the normal page width and you have to squeeze that down, they're not going to be able to read a lot of the stuff on there. So just make sure that you keep that in mind. And here's an example of a database dump from SQL injection. There was a lot of information. There were several, several rows of information of uh, personally identifiable, identifiable information and things that I wanted to show. But obviously doing a huge screenshot of that, as you can see, if I were to put this and squeeze it down on a, a document, like a printable document, it's gonna be really hard to read that, especially with the black background and green text. So just you know, copy that and paste it onto something that looks maybe more like this. It's a lot more legible and they're not trying to squint to see what's important. And again, with this example, uh, you can see the highlighted area in the username parameter. I called that out that way during the report review or during remediation. They can quickly see what it is that they need to throw into that parameter to get the same results to show that it's vulnerable to SQL injection. And this would be, you know, for cross-site scripting or, or whatever it is that you're trying to call out, whatever the vulnerability is or what the payload that you sent to trigger that, make sure you highlight those just to make it easier for them. And then, uh, like for example, the SQL injection where it showed the username, you also wanna make sure to test like the password parameter or any single, any parameter that is within that application, check it for SQL injection as well or whatever it is that you're looking for and make sure to document those. Uh, I've actually seen junior pen testers where they just find, for example, the username is vulnerable, and then they ask, well, what about the password parameter? And they say, well, I don't know. I found it on username parameter and moved on. So just make sure you're checking every parameter within the application. So when you're doing a pen test, there's so many things to look for, and there's a lot of stuff to do. And so something that highly recommend that's highly recommended is to have a methodology to go by such as OWASP and this is more of a kind of a checklist to help keep you in line to make sure you're not forgetting something and I do want to stress don't just limit yourself to that methodology as a checklist in case there's something that it's leaving out but just use it just more of a reminder for each assessment Something else uh, that you want to make sure you're doing when you're looking at a web app, you want to go and look out on the internet to see what you can find through open source intelligence. Because this will help figure out if there's already been a breach for this company, or there have been so many times where I've actually found uh, like database types, database schemas, keys, temporary usernames and passwords, as well as the email address of the developers working on the application, and all of that stuff was still relevant. 
Uh, so you can find things like that that are out there. So a tip to developers, if you are posting something on a help forum and you you know where you're trying to get help for uh, some SQL calls or, or anything, any, tor any, any type of programming, make sure that you sanitize your information before you share it with the world. So just change, change the database name, change something slightly where if someone like me finds it, it's not gonna be relevant to that application. And at the end of an assessment, if you have someone that's helping you out, uh, or uh, not the end of the assessment, but if you have someone that's helping you out on these dev forms, and you give them temporary access or something, make sure that you cut off that account when they're finished. Try not to forget about it, because that has helped us to, you know, dump some databases. And so, it's a funny graphic. A quick tool that I like to use, and there are so many of these out there for uh, open source intelligence, is Discover by Lee Baird. And uh, I don't think that that comes pre-installed in Kali. I think you install that yourself. It's pretty easy. Uh, but as you can see, it does quick recon for, you can put in the domain that you're assessing or a person's name, or uh, it can also parse Salesforce. And there, there are several things that you can do that really help save time. And you're gonna hear me talk too about Nick2. It will automatically watch Nick2 for you to search against, just do a quick, scan against the website for known backup files, known admin URLs, or anything that would be, I guess, low-hanging fruit for an attacker. Okay, automated scanning. So why do you use automated tools? You're supposed to be a hacker. Well, they're a huge time saver. So. When we run, when we start these assessments, we usually only have a week, maybe two weeks for a single application. So it, it's going to move pretty quick. So a cool thing about the automated scanners is that it's going to spider, it's going to go through and look at, at everything as quick as possible. And again, it's going to help you find a little hanging fruit, such as if there's cross-site scripting or potential SQL injection or uh, you know, if it's found backup files or anything that these scanners can find pretty quick, it's just a nice, nice tool to have. Uh, however, a vulnerability scan is not a pen test. It's just a vulnerability scan. So to those who say that a vuln scan is a pen test, there you go. So even that, why is it not a pen test? Well, it's just scanning for vulnerabilities. It's not going through and trying to exploit those even further and you'll, you're gonna get false positives. So you have to go through and verify, manually verify all of the results from these automated scanners if you're gonna use those. Um, a lot of times you can actually go, the scanners will have a button built in where you can actually replay the attack and, I, and see more in depth the response. And that will help you determine right away if it's a false positive or not. So while you're verifying those, again, it helps you get out the, the things that are false positives and the things that aren't, you can dig deeper into those. So if you find cross-site scripting and the scanner is just bringing back the prompt that says XSS in it, you know, take that further. Can you do an inclusion of like a keylogger script or something, or uh, what can you do to take that further? A few automated scanners. I know there's so many out there, a lot of free ones, but the ones that I use personally, uh, Nessus, and this is a good one that can quickly look at the host itself. I know you can specify credentials and things to do authenticated scans but uh, I use this mostly just to specifically look at the host. IBM AppScan is another good one that uh, I like to use. It's, it's pretty robust. It's really good for authenticated scans and you have quite a bit of control over that. Burp Suite Pro, you're gonna hear me mention that several times. I love this tool. It's again, it has uh, automated scanning built into it as well as manual. There's a lot of manual testing that we do through this as well, but it's kind of my one-stop shop, I suppose, for web app testing. 
And then, as I already mentioned, there's Nick 2, which is great for uh, looking for CGI vulnerabilities, uh, vulnerable scripts, more. And I use these tools separately. All the tools that I've mentioned so far, I use those all separately because uh, they're all going to have slightly different results. And so it's, it's good to get different results and not just rely on a single tool. So if someone is having you look at a website that's open source, like a, a, you know, a framework like WordPress or Drupal or Joomla or something like that, Hello there. Uh, there's some cool, cool tools like this WP scan, and it's specifically for WordPress. And so the cool thing about this is it will go through and it'll tell you automatically the version and if it's out of date so that you're not having to Google and reference to see, okay, is this the most current version? Because WordPress, they update their versions where like every other week or something. Uh, so it's, it's a good scan for that. It also scans, it will enumerate any plugins that they're using. So if they are using a plugin that has known vulnerabilities, it'll tell you, such as like the old timthumb.php that had the exploit where you could basically upload and, and take control of the website through this script. It will also enumerate usernames. So this is cool because if you know the usernames and they don't have any sort of uh, blocking on the website, you can potentially brute force those usernames. So uh, they, again, they have tools like this for Drupal and Joomla and other known er, and Cold Fusion. I love getting Cold Fusion sites because they're so easy to hack. And then again, for automated scanning, a, a thing I like to find or I like to use is OWASP's Durbuster. And this is basically a brute force tool that will go through, and you can do a pure brute force to find directory names that exist that aren't linked in the other content. Or you can feed it a list, a very large list that it comes with of known uh, directory and file names. And you can also, if you look on the bottom right, I don't know if you can see it back there, but uh, you can also specify file extensions that you want to look want it to look for. So here you would you would load the word list, and let's say it looks for uh, index, and then it would go .php, you know, .espx, .html, whatever extensions you add in there, and so it goes through and it will actually brute force and give you a good list of things. It takes a long time, but it can pay off, especially if you're looking at a web app that seems pretty secure and you're kind of hitting a wall and not really sure what to do next, let this tool run for a while and you might find something good. And then for, again, for automated scanners, uh, in Kali, and this is different now since Kali 2, but in Kali version 1, uh, this was the, the path to find more web scanners that are built in. And then Saint and Nexpos, those are other popular ones as well. Okay, a few pro tips for automated scanning. So you want to verify the settings. It's really bad, it's a bad idea if you just open a scanner, put in the URL and click run. Uh, several things can happen. You can flood the host, cause a potential denial of service because let's say if it's an old, really old outdated server or system, then you could knock it over. That's actually happened quite a few times for larger clients that you would hope aren't using old legacy systems, but sadly, it's still pretty common. So, um, you know, look at the number of connections that it's gonna make to a host at a single time. And this is something too, like the more that you do this, the more you'll kind of figure out just from browsing at the website initially, the response time and, and uh, looking at the code, you'll be able to start to tell if this, some, if this is something that you can hit really hard, you kind of have to baby it. During the kickoff call, something that's very important to ask, are there any pages or functions that you want us to avoid during the assessment? So for example, if they have a contact form or something that your automated scanner is just gonna keep hitting over and over again, there's gonna be some poor soul that's gonna get thousands of emails, notifications from this form, or it's gonna junk up a database or something. So make sure to ask those questions, like what do you want us to avoid? Or on the other hand, 
is there something that you really want us to focus on? Do you have a, a, a page that's more sensitive that you want us to spend more time on than the other things? And they'll tell you, they'll let you know. Um, another issue I've found is even if a web page, even if a site doesn't exist, or I'm sorry, a page doesn't exist, and you're doing these automated scanners, you're gonna get a, a 200 okay response from everything. So like in Burp Suite Pro or something, it's gonna, everything that you have in your dictionary that you're looking for, it's gonna return everything that it's an actual page. That's a pain in the butt to clean up and it takes forever to, to go through. So in these scanners, most of them will let you specify a page not found, where you can change it to 200 okay and give it the size and it will basically take that as a 404 page not found. Uh, configure the login process. So if you do have credentials, make sure that uh, you, know, you test those beforehand and make sure they work. And then that way it's not like Wednesday night or Thursday morning and the assessment's over on Friday and you're just now asking the client to check the credentials they gave you because they're not working. That looks bad. So uh, make sure you check that out to make sure you're, again, that you can log in okay. And uh, something I don't have on here that I wanna make sure to, to stress too is always do an application assessment as an unauthenticated user and then as an authenticated user. So in the kickoff call, make sure you ask for, okay, are there admin level credentials? And I also need regular level user credentials. That way you can look for things uh, such as um, privilege escalation. So are you able to get to pages that the admin could see as the regular user? Or as an unauthenticated user, are you able to get to pages and functions that an authenticated user can see? Does that make sense? So always make sure to ask for all levels of authentication accounts. And then once you have everything set up and you are, uh, you know, you're confident about your settings, then you can go ahead and let the automated scanner go. Then as I mentioned earlier, I'll, I'll skip past this, but as I mentioned earlier, make sure that you really manually verify the automated scanner results. It's gonna be bad if you just trust the scanner and throw it in the report and the client's looking at it and they can't replicate the results because there's nothing to replicate. And then they ask you about it and you can't give them an answer other than, uh, oops, sorry. So that's, that's not ever a good situation. Okay, are there any questions so far? I know I'm moving through quite a bit of stuff pretty quick. I'll have, I'm gonna leave time at the end for questions too. So if you have any, let me know it when we're done too. I'll ask this question for later. <coughs> Specific tools for a Joomla website. Okay, yeah. I, I'll get to that. So uh, we'll go over manual testing. Again, this is something that is so high level because with manual testing, there are so many different ways to do this. Um, that if you, if you get stuck on something, Google is gonna be your best friend. There are so many free videos out there that will teach you for free exactly what it is you're wanting to do. So if you ever get stuck on, on how to exploit SQL injection or how do you take cross-site scripting further or something like, or remote file inclusion um, or anything like that, make sure that you, you know, check it out on Google and it will, you will learn how to do it. A few things to look at while you're manually crawling the app. You know, look at the response. What is the server running? Is it Apache? Is it IIS? Is it outdated? There's a lot of times, as I mentioned, some old legacy systems or unpatched systems that are vulnerable to things such as Heartbleed or something that's really easy to exploit. Uh, there have been several times where we've been able to compromise the entire host without look getting into the web app the web app because the host was unpatched so make sure you check that out too uh, you heard me talk about parameters earlier fuzz in any parameter you find fuzz those things if you're not sure exactly what fuzzing is or how to do it again google will 
will give you tools to do that, uh, such as looking for cross-site scripting or SQL injection, things like that. And again, here's just a quick reference of, of popular things to look for that are pretty easy to find in a lot of web apps. So uh, just get familiar with how to exploit these things. And then uh, Burp Suite Pro, the cool thing I like about Burp Suite Pro is that if you have any of these lists uh, from OWASP or something that are known, uh, let's say they're known payloads to try and pop cross-site scripting, you can throw that list in there and specify what parameter you want it to go or want it to go to and it will automatically run through that list. Same thing, if you're just wanting to do a really quick and dirty check for SQL injection or just, just general data validation, you can throw in some list with Burp Suite Pro and then you can specify the parameter and run and you can, within a minute or so, depending on how large the list is, you'll get your response to see if these parameters are being filtered properly or if not, you'll be able to tell pretty quick if that's something you should keep pursuing. A few more things to look at. Are they passing sensitive information through uh, in the URL through GET requests instead of POST requests? So for example, when you're logging in and you click go in the URL, do you see the, your username or your password or anything that's sensitive like that? Uh, you want to look for that because if it's not being cached properly or if there's man in the middle attack or if someone gains control of that host later on, then they can see in the history, they can simply see in the history, in the URL, the, these potential credentials or sensitive information. So you want to make sure that anything sensitive is going through a post request instead of a get request. Comments and source code. This is a great one that it seems like probably 80 to 90% of assessments that I do, I find something good just through comments and source code of someone pointing to, you know, referencing a database name or credentials or something that they left as a comment to another developer for debugging. Or they'll, you can see, they'll leave a line, a comment for basically every line telling you exactly what that code does. Well, if you look at that, sometimes you can engineer that and, and use that to your advantage to figure out, okay, I know exactly what this JavaScript is doing and where it's getting whatever from because the developers just told me exactly what it does. So make sure that you're going through and looking for those comments in the source code. It's really time consuming. I can kind of get old sometimes, but that uh, does pay off. Now to prevent death by PowerPoint, there's a happy dog. <clears throat> so as I mentioned earlier, uh, authentication, this is a good reason, again, to test as an unauthenticated user as well as authenticated users. Uh, is there something that you can get to that you're not supposed to see? Uh, so many times uh, people try to use security by obscurity so whether you're a regular user or you're an admin level user, they try to hide certain links from you just from JavaScript. Well, if you go look at the code, you can see the links in there. If it says admin slash whatever, all you have to do is copy and paste that, and now you're looking at admin pages that were supposed to be hidden uh, from the view. Um, so go through, look at different, look at different URLs, especially if it says admin on it, because I know it sounds silly, but that's most of the time what they're gonna say is admin, or they'll say, if, if you're not an admin, hide this, or whatever. It's, it's really obvious sometimes how they do that, because developers don't want to, you know, you don't wanna rename everything where you have to try and have some reference to go through just to know, understand what it is that your code is supposed to do, so, you name it what it is to save time, right? And then check password requirements. Can you set your password as ABC123 or just password? If so, that's a weak password and that's a finding, so you wanna document that. 
they need to be at least eight characters and they should require special characters as well. As I mentioned, look at the host, not just the app. Uh, look for something that's outdated. Again, are there admin portals available too? A lot of times you'll find like Apache Tomcat or cPanel or something that is accessible to the public, which is a vulnerability that should only be accessible by certain IPs instead of widely available, depending on use case. Um, and again, if you're not quite sure what the use case is, but you think it's a vulnerability, I would still report it anyway, and then you can always talk that through with the client during the report review. And if they say, well, this has to be available because this is how they access whatever, and it makes sense, then you can always drop that. But it's better to be safe than sorry. Uh, you want to look for HTTP methods that are dangerous, such as put, copy, delete, and trace. I've actually compromised a few hosts simply because they had put enabled, and so I put a laudanum script up that gave me a shell to the host and pretty much had my way with it and compromised it within maybe 20, 30 minutes of the assessment. So look for those things. If they have any HTTP methods enabled that you're not sure about why they're using it, again, report that and then talk it through later with them on the report call. Uh, you know, I mentioned directory or heart lead, so you all also want to look for things like directory traversal. And a lot of your automated scanners and things such as NIC2 will automatically look for those for you as well. And this, this particular example is a great reason or a great example of scanners saving you a lot of time. Because I don't know about you, but going up to the URL and doing dot dot forward slash dot dot forward slash typing that seven times and it doesn't work then trying it eight times and nine times it's going to be very time consuming so uh, the automated scanners really help with things like that nmap is great as well what what ports are open are do they have everything open to the world do they have remote desktop open to the public which does happen um, or is it just port 80 and 443 are they pretty well secure as far as that goes you want to look at those things too. SSL TLS settings. Uh, if you know, if, as you may know, there are a lot of vulnerabilities with SSL, different versions, and then uh, TLS versions, and weak ciphers. So there are several free tools that will actually go and quickly scan their their SSL and TLS settings, so you can let them know, hey, you have old CBC ciphers or uh, you know, a weak signing key or whatever it is, make sure that you're looking at the SSL TLS settings as well. Or are they even using SSL? If, you know, certain websites, if they have authentication or something that should be protected, if it's not going over a secure connection, that's a vulnerability. So just, just pay attention to those things. And then as I mentioned earlier, check out different methodologies. I know OWASP is a pretty popular one. Again, this helps keep you on track. And if, if you're just getting into this, you're not exactly sure what to Google or what to look for, um, where do I start, what things do I start looking at, these methodologies will help get you on track and help, again, they will keep you on track. So uh, make sure you practice in a lab. There's some vulnerable VMs, some vulnerable web apps that are vulnerable on purpose for you to practice all of these things and the safety of your own lab or your own computer because you never want to go into a client site and run a tool that you've never used before because if you don't know what it does don't do it especially especially on a client site a production site because if you break something and they come in and they say what did you do and you say I don't know that's bad that's a bad day so just make sure you practice and then once you're ready and you feel confident, then there you go, go hack some websites. So uh, that's basically it for slides, but how are we doing on time? Still have 10, 10, 10 minutes? minutes, okay. Yeah, we got 
plenty of time for Q and A. Again, I know that was a lot of information pretty quick. So, any questions you guys have? Oh, Joomla. If you have any specific tools that you didn't mention up here, yeah. Um, I'll get with you after the talk. I cannot yeah. remember the name of it, but I'll show you on Cali really okay. quick. I just. I, can't there is like a Juice scan or Joom scan, which is similar. to Yeah, Joom scan. That's the name of it. Yeah. Yeah. If your hacking tool actually breaks the website, isn't that a vulnerability in of itself? Yes, yes. it is, and that's actually uh, that's a great point because we've had clients that have gotten so upset with us that it's almost like that that infrastructure for that website just died because it would send out. Let's say, for example, the contact form. We scanned it, and it would send out a notification. So that would go to the email server, and then the attack would go to the email server, and then that was trying to send an email back to this server to let it know something was going on. And so, so I guess high level, what happened is say one, one malicious attack that was sent was triggering four and five email events back and forth between because they had it set up some stupid way. And so they wanted to get mad at us for flooding the system when all we did was did a basic scan that for a hundred other clients caused no issues. And so that, that's a great point. If your automated scan your, that it should be handled by everything breaks something, you have bigger issues. No. Anybody else? Not all at once, please. <laughs> Would you just mention the importance of not only having your uh, terms of engagement spelled out, but also um, from the scanner side, either an LLC or some type of insurance, or if you break something big time and it causes loss of money on their end. Um, yeah, and that's part of that's this different side of the house than what I technically get involved in. I know that's handled by legal and by sales, but there are things that mention, hey, uh, we aren't liable for whatever. And you also want to make sure that you're covered too to say, I'm not exactly sure the wording, don't quote me on this because I'm not a lawyer, but it's basically saying uh, there is a chance that we're not going to find everything. So if you're compromised from something that we happen to overlook, we're not responsible for that because good reason for that is Web apps change all the time. So let's say if I if I look at your web app last month and you guys have a version update or something, or a new exploit becomes available out in the wild that wasn't available when we looked at that, I mean, there's what can you do about that? Unless you want us to do an assessment every month or every week, and that gets pretty expensive pretty quick. So you do have to have the verbiage in there basically covering the company and just letting them know, like, we will find what we can find. We might overlook some things, and if we do, we aren't responsible for that, so. You say a uh, auto web scan tool could crash somebody's website. Is that something you would do in a lab? Yeah, well, purpose? see, that's one of those things, too, that practicing that stuff in a lab, if your lab environment handles it, that's cool. But then you could go into an environment where, again, it's an old legacy system or they, there are misconfigurations on the server for, you know, like the example I gave where the server was sending so many email instances over and over. So it, it's kind of hard to say, yeah, do it in a lab and then it'll never happen in a client environment. It's kind of hard to say that. Uh, so a way to sort of fix that, I mean, it does happen sometimes, unfortunately. But all you can do when it does happen is just be ready to pause the scanner. Don't ever start a scanner and then leave for lunch. <laughs> That's really bad and you're like, uh, you gotta kill the scan, something's going wrong. I'm like, oh, all right, I'll do it in about an hour. Like, that's not gonna fly. And you guys laugh at that, but that's been an issue. I know there have been a couple of consultants, one who's uh, no longer with the company he was with because that was an issue a couple of times. And uh, so, yeah, that's another great tip. Don't hit a, don't start an automated scanner and then leave. Make sure you're there to babysit it. That way you can give them logs, whatever, and they can figure out what caused it. 
if, do you have you ever run into a situation where have you ever run into a situation where the client says okay you can t you can test this particular machine but you're not supposed to, but it's not supposed to affect any linked machines and then you get something like that email server issue that goes beyond the machine you were supposed to be testing for vulnerabilities yeah we uh, we have that issue we have some people or clients that um, have pretty sensitive websites that lead to other highly sensitive things and so this is where scope is very important so that's where for example the automated scanners you want to make sure that you're specifying the scope and then where they say don't hit this submit page because that actually goes out of scope to this other site and you don't want to start spidering that just because it was linked so that's where you during the kickoff call you ask what do you want us to exclude and then you make sure to specify those in your automated scanner as well as any manual scanning just keep those notes you know like the uh, the keep note thing that I found in my scope on my scope page I will list things that we are not supposed to hit and I'll make sure to reference that and make sure that I'm not goofing and forgetting something but that that does happen pretty regularly so what about the timing of when you're doing these kind of tests? Like, do you, do you uh, when you go in with a, uh, a client, you know, do they say, we don't want you to do this test during these peak business hours because if you do find a huge vulnerability, you just crash our system, we're losing millions of dollars now. So how often does that, you know, like are you doing mostly like weekends, nights? Uh, all, everything. Mm -hmm. So we have clients that have pretty strong systems and good, dev teams they have the budget to have their production and then pretty much a mirror in a dev site so with that during the kickoff call the rules of engagement we will specify from this date to this date to all manual and automated scanning is 24 by 7 and then we have clients that say uh, this is a production site so if the the chance that anything can be brought down only do all automated scanning from 6 p.m. to 5 a.m. Manual testing can be 24 by 7. So yeah, that we do have to specify those terms a lot. And we do have some that only want us to do Friday night to Sunday morning. So uh, that's kind of unfortunate because it kind of takes up your weekend sometimes. But, uh, you know, it's not that bad. It doesn't happen as often, but it does happen. So. Are you obligated to report anything that was not in the scope that you may have uh, inadvertently came across? Um, so the question, am I obligated to report anything that I've found that was not necessarily in scope? Uh, I think I probably from an ethical standpoint, I feel as though I am. I, contractually, I'm not quite sure of how like fine print everything gets. But there have been a few instances where say like through the, the open source intelligence part where I was doing footprint, I actually found another web app on the host that was given to us where I uploaded a laudanum script and it gave me you know shell to that. And I probably shouldn't have done that because it wasn't necessarily the application that was given, but I felt like it was a, an extra service that I provided to the client because I knew right away when I saw it that it was really old and that it would be vulnerable. And so I just wanted to check. Now, when I reported that to them, I did it as a separate email. Guys, I found this, I want you to know this, but I did not include it in their official report because it was out of scope. So uh, I think as long as you do it that, that way, uh, always ask, hey guys, I think I found this are you cool if I just check it out just to make sure because what I think it is is pretty critical and pretty easy to exploit. Most of the time they'll say, oh yeah, let us know because we don't, you know, we don't want to have a major breach. So just check with them and then again if it's out of scope, just like, hey, here's a freebie, but keep it out of the report <coughs> since it's not in scope. Does that make sense? Cool. Any more? Awesome. All right, guys, thanks for not falling asleep on me and participating. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions. I'll give you my card. You're free to email me at any time. Thanks.